We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I'm coming at you with another one of our FHD Vault episodes for you. So last week we had Chris Willis on to talk about Bronco Nagurski. You know, Chris Willis over at NFL Films had a research. So I figured why not dig deep into that vault and let's go learn more about Chris Willis' time at NFL Films, a little bit about Red Grange, and anything else that comes up. So this episode was actually a two-parter. It was aired first originally on March 11th of 2020, and then we had the following week. So today we'll listen to part one, and then tomorrow we'll listen to part two. If you're listening to this on part two, it's the same thing. Today you're listening to part two, and yesterday you listened to part one. So, kick back, relax, and listen to the first time we had Chris Willis on the Football History Dude podcast. And after you do that, go take a look at Chris Willis all over the Sports History Network because many of our football history-related shows have had some kind of influence from Chris, either as an interview or even the Orville Mulligan podcast he provided research for, especially in the Chicago episode. Head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast so you can see all of the different shows that we have over there. Today you listen to part two, and yesterday you listen to part one. So, in January of 1996, legendary coach Don Shula officially retired from the NFL. He left the game as the winningest coach in league history, a record that still stands and may never be broken. Whether it was being drafted to play for Paul Brown during the heyday of the Browns, being hired by the Colts as the then youngest head coach in NFL history, or I don't know, being the head coach of the team with the only perfect season in league history, Shula has been involved in many great moments of the past half century. In the same year, this week's guest started his career retelling these moments and many more, and it all revolved around NFL Films. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is January 4th, 1930, and we are in Grand River, Ohio, where we're here to celebrate the great Don Shula coming into this world. But during this time, the man that he would ultimately pass on the all-time victory list in the NFL, well, that guy already had 10 seasons under his belt. And that guy was Mr. George Papa Bear Hallis. Shula would grow up to not only pass Papa Bear on the all-time list, but he would also become arguably the greatest coach of all time. Then he retired in 1996 walking away from the game as a living legend. In this same year, a legend in the world of NFL films would walk into the doors for the first time. 
or at least officially. Chris Willis was hired as the NFL Films Head of Research Library. And although that sounds cool, I mean, what exactly does that mean? Well, we're going to go ahead and dive into that in this week's episode. And if you want to learn more about this week's guest, Chris Willis, and the things that we talk about in the episode, you can head to his dedicated page on the website, which, by the way, you can go ahead and find that at thefootballhistorydude.com slash Chris Willis. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com slash Chris Willis. And also, I mean, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes. Well, each and every week. But how about I don't make you wait anymore for the interview? Let's dive right into it with Mr. Chris Willis. Hey, Chris, welcome to the Football History Do Podcast. Uh, thanks for having me, Ryan. Appreciate it. For sure. And of course, we had to bring you on as the resident historian of NFL films. And uh, I, the first question I got to ask is, how did you fall into the head of the research library over at NFL Films? Uh, yeah, it was um, a sort of roundabout way. Um, when I was in college, uh, I played um, football and was going to school at a small school in Ohio, uh, Urbana University. Uh, and I always thought I wanted to get into coaching. I uh, was a physical education major and wanted to get into coaching. And um, when I looked at some grad school programs, uh, I saw that sports history was a major um at Ohio State University, which was in my hometown of Columbus. So I thought that was a perfect um, a way to, to, to continue my education and, and, and either get into coaching or the, uh, uh, further uh, sort of the, the sort of football part of, of what I wanted to pursue. And sports history was a big uh, thing for me. I, I loved uh, the game of football and I loved the history part. Um, you know, grew up, uh, my dad owned a used bookstore. So uh was able to read a lot of books, so uh, was able to get into that program um, after graduating from Urbana. And um, so I took classes in the sports history department uh, at Ohio State for a year and a half and then wanted to do an internship, uh, which my my advisor and professor was um, fine with. And uh, so I sort of branched out and sort of tried to you know, write, communicate to, to places I thought might could do an internship, you know, with teams or, you know, Pro Football Hall of Fame. So NFL Films was one of those on my list. Um, so in the fall of 1995, uh, I was able to get an internship at NFL Films, you know, working in the archives department, uh, doing just research for their shows, um, which was a tremendous experience and uh, enjoyed it. It was the, um, the fall of 95, so it was during the season. And then after the season, I was expecting to go back to grad school, but they, uh, said I should stick around because they were going to start um, a, a tape library for the producers. Um, they were leaning towards transferring everything to tape at that time. And uh, so I just stuck around and applied for the job and they, and they uh, accepted, you know, and, and hired me. So that's sort of the roundabout way of getting from, from uh, grad school to NFL films. And then uh, like I said, that was almost 25 years ago. So when you say sports history program, what does that entail at Ohio state? Uh, well, at that time, you know, like this is the mid nineties, you, you, uh, it was within the physical education department. So they had sports philosophy, sports psychology, uh, sports management and sports history. So you were one of the four branches there at the time. So I had to take classes in all, all four disciplines, but the majority of my classes were in, in, in sort of the sports history and, and, and history type of, uh, category. So would that be going over the history of how the games were founded and, and uh, events, or was it more along like the fundamentals? No, it was everything. It was, you know, how they got started, you know, people that were involved, um, you know, uh, the fundamentals, like er everything to do with the sort of aspect of, of any sport. <laughs> I wish I would have known about that when I was going to school. That sounded like something I would have been interested in. So then is that how you got into, like, you were intrigued more from there to the point where you wanted to launch your career? Or was there, like, a deep-rooted, uh, kind of like when you were a little kid, this is what I feel like I want to do when I grow up? Well, I always, like I said, being from Ohio, you can't help a lot of people uh, being a football fan. You know, I grew up in Columbus, you know, being a huge high state football fan and going to the games. Um, like I said, it that 
just sort of went off my passion for the sport is also reading about it. You know, like I said, my dad's used bookstore was a huge influence on me of reading anything that I could get my hands on. Um, you know, not just football, but other, you know, I'm a huge, I love nonfiction. So I, so I read a lot of biographies, you know, his, historical books. Um, so that sort of got me started in, in, in knowing history and liking to preserve history. Um, and that sort of just sort of developed into the sport that I love. You know, I love football. I love playing it. I love watching it. You know, I love reading about it. So, um, so a lot of those early influences, it sort of, uh, drives me to what I want to do, what I do today. You know, like every day I want to try to preserve something or, or to, you know, further, you know, the historical part of, of football. And it's, it's neat. And I've been lucky that, you know, I can make a career out of it. Um, but yeah, that sort of drives me you know, almost every day, you know, of, of, of wanting to, especially to preserve history. And, you know, we do it in our films, but, you know, also in my writing and research. So it all combines in, into one sort of, you know, avenue of, of trying to preserve sort of the history of the game. Yeah. And speaking of your writing and your research, uh, can you tell me about your first book that you wrote? What caused that kind of spark in your fire and you wanted to write it and what it was about? Yeah, I mean, I didn't plan, um, you know, especially you know, going through grad school, and then then once I started working at NFL Films, you know, obviously we have our documentaries and our shows that we focus on. But uh, so I didn't plan on writing, uh, you know, multiple books uh, that sort of just developed, at, you know, as going through and doing a lot of research, you know, for our shows. Um, um, my first project came out of some of my writing based on some interviews I did. Um, in the late 1990s, you know, uh, I was sort of branching out and doing a little more research on some of the early years of the NFL. So, uh, at that point, you know, that whole generation of, of sort of play, especially players who started in the twenties and thirties, they were slowly, you know, passing away. So I, I hated seeing that. I was like, Oh, we have to preserve some of these stories. So I, I was able to pitch some shows and some, some, uh, some pieces that we did for NFL film based on guys who played in the twenties and thirties and even in the early forties. Um, you know, so it was nice to, to be able to preserve some of that. So from some of those interviews, I started sort of just writing some chapters. Um, I think you're a member of the pro football research association. They have a magazine called the coffee corner that comes out, you know, um, every other month. So I started writing some of these, um, sort of small articles based on some of these interviews I was doing, you know, with people from the twenties and thirties and they published a few of them and they got a good response. And I was like, you know what, maybe this could become a book. And uh, some of my, a couple of my favorite books uh, are or histories uh, that were written, you know, um, you know, Myron Cope, the old Steeler announcer wrote a book called uh, the game that was uh, Bob Curran, the, the Buffalo writer wrote one uh, pro football rag days. And probably my favorite was Richard Winningham, who was a Chicago freelance writer who did one um, in the mid-80s when I was growing up called What a Game They Played. And these are all sort of oral histories. He would interview, you know, Don Hudson and Sammy Ball and Johnny Blood and Red Grange. And they would just be chapters of these guys' stories. And those were really, they were really fun and, you know, uh, you know, you know, easy to read, uh, but had a lot of great, you know, historical value. And, and so those sort of inspired me once I started doing some of these interviews with, with some players and, and some people associated with the early game of the NFL, uh, I started writing some chapters and that's where old leather came from. And, uh, and I sort of narrowed it down to, um, to uh, the team from Ohio. So it's old leather and oral history of early pro football in Ohio from 1920 to 1935. And, uh, so these chapters are all based on interviews that I did or archival interviews that I found because um, there wasn't as many people alive uh, in, in the early 2000s to talk about, you know, some of these early years. So, um, so it's a short book. It's, it's like less than 200 pages um, based on these interviews. So that sort of got me started. And once that was done and, and I found a publisher who liked the idea, um, you know, that, that book came out in 2005. Uh, that sort of really got me started on doing book projects, you know, uh, you know, offsetting, you know, some of the work I was doing at NFL films, you know, all, all my writing is, it, you know, I, I sort of pay all the expenses. I go do it on my own time. I write in the morning, I write in the evening, write on the weekends. So, uh, 
it's not something that they helped me do. I sort of do it on my own. So, uh, so that's sort of how to, uh, the, the writing got started with Old Leather, which was the first book. I know you said you didn't get a chance to interview many of the individuals, of course, because of the timing uh, of the interviews that you're able to. Did you do you have one that stuck out in your mind? Uh, yeah, I think out of the, the early ones that I did, uh, especially for Old Leather, uh, the one with Glenn Presnell. He was uh, uh, at the at the time he was in his you know or, or like ninety. He was like ninety years old, and he was living in Ironton, Ohio. He played for the Ironton Tanks, um, and then the Portsmouth Spartans, who became the Detroit Lions. So um, he was one of my favorites. You know, like that he was still living. Uh, I was able to interview him twice. You know, with my trip down to Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, and uh, he was just really nice and like that. And, and he was pretty sharp, you know, for somebody that was, you know, you know, in his nineties, <laughs> you know, or, or reaching 90, he was still pretty sharp and he could tell, you know, he wasn't, you know, super detailed, but a lot of these guys, as you get older, you know, you know they, they don't know or they don't sort of reveal some of the details, but they give you good stories and good opinions on things and, and stuff like that. So Presnell was one of the ones that I really liked. Uh, now like I said, I was able to do them twice you know, over the time, um, you know, I believe he lived to be almost 99 years old, you know, um, so, um, uh, so, so he was, so he had been around and he was a pretty good player. I mean, he wasn't a hall of famer. Um, his name has been brought up, but the borderline sort of candidate, but, uh, but he was a really good player, uh, was all pro, you know, once or twice in his career, um, and led the league in scoring once and stuff. So he was, um, it was very enjoyable to, to, to talk to and get his reflections uh, of playing in those early days. And you, you mentioned the Pro Football Researchers Association, and uh, you received the Ralph Hay Award, the Lifetime, Lifetime Achievement Award. What all does that recognize, and uh, what was that for? Yeah, well, I've been a member of the PFRA. Uh, about, that was when I was in grad school, right, or even before I got to grad school, like 93. 1993 is when I became a member uh, of, of that organization. And, um, because I found out they were, you know, they're just a bunch of historians and, and people that like the game and stuff. So, um, so when the award was announced, they just, they just sort of sent me an email and said, Oh, you're, you're this year's winner and stuff. So it, it, it's really just a, a nice honor. There's no, there's no like banquet or anything or any award, you know, they sort of, uh, they might send, they sent me, a, I think, a small, uh, like certificate. Uh, but I think it's more based on just the, the amount of years I put in doing research, you know, you know, you know, pretty much since 95, you know, so, uh, um, probably came a little bit earlier in, in my career, you know, uh, but it's just nice that those guys recognize somebody, you know, every year that sort of, you know, doesn't get as much publicity. You know, if you look at the list, if you look at the list of the Ralph Hay winners, you know, they're not common names. They're, they're not the, the, you know, the well-known sports writers are just historians that like to, you know, preserve the history and, and write about it, you know, and stuff like that. So, so it was nice to be honored. Yeah. It's very cool that they do that. Just like the whole, uh, like you said, uh, coffin corner that comes out every other month. Um, I, again, like you said, I am a member of the PFRA and I enjoy reading those and, uh, Digging into just all the articles that they have for, geez, since like, what was it, the 70s that they were founded, I think it was? Yeah, I think uh, 1977 um, was the first year that they, uh, or was 79. Yeah, so, yeah, so they've been around, you know, for, for over four, uh, I guess, 40 years now. So it's, um, uh, yeah, it's a nice little organization. Yeah, uh, the Club Corner, you know, has sort of unique articles and it's, it's, and it's even for aspiring historians or even, you know, authors that just want to try out some of the writing, you know, they appreciate people uh, who submit articles, you know, and, and a lot of it is just, it could be off the wall or really specific things, you know, about specific teams or players or events, you know, it's just not, you know, your general stuff that you you know, find on Wikipedia or something. You can get real specific about stuff and, and they'll publish it for you and stuff. So, uh, um, that's how I got started with some of my writing, you know, with, with, on pro football history, you know, uh, um, so it, it is a nice little, um, publication and, and organization to be a part of. Yeah. I find myself gravitating towards, even when I do Google searches, I, I land on their pages quite often. And uh, I think it's Bob Carroll's the one I'm thinking of, but that guy cracks me up when I read a lot of his older articles. Yeah. He was one of the founders. 
Uh, Joe Horrigan, who just retired at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, you know, after 40 years, was another one of the original founders. Uh, but Bob was one of the sort of icons, uh, in early pro football, uh, history and, and preserving it. Um, you know, uh, he'd been around for a long time. So a lot of his writings and, and actually finding some of the history and, and, you know, sort of debunking some of the early stuff that wasn't researched quite as well. You know, Bob was, uh, sort of a major uh, player in, in preserving some of that. For most NFL fans, with when it comes to learning about the history of the game, they do rely on the organization you work for in NFL Films. Uh, what really? What's your role there? What all? Can you kind of explain what you do for, a, say, a documentary from start to finish? Yeah, um, I mean, first, my, my day-to-day responsibility is. Uh, like I said, running the research library. So usually, uh, when one of our producers, uh, when they get an assignment, they, they can come to, to the library or, you know, or my department and just figure out what they need, you know, what, what we have in house, you know, footage wise, if they need something out of house, you know, we can steer them towards that. So, uh, yes, yeah, so when a producer's ready, you know, he can, um, you know, he can come and, and just figure out what we have. Uh, and we, and we find it for them, you know, so whether it's, uh, just a specific shot, you know, that they're looking for, um, or, you know, different highlights or different shows, um, you know, we, we have it all there that you can sort of steer them to and then they can, they can start on the project, you know, uh, uh, start editing, uh, whatever they need. So, um, then later on, if there's additional research that needs to be done, um, or I, I, I usually watch the piece and then, you know, you know, give them a little more direction or say, Hey, this could be do, uh, this could be done, you know, better or they could find this type of footage. Um, then I also look at scripts. We want to make sure everything's sort of factually correct. That's a huge thing, you know, with more eyeballs watching our shows. Um, with social media now, you don't want, you don't really want anything to be incorrect because people will notice it and call you on it. <laughs> so, um, so fact checking, you know, scripts, make sure scripts are correct. Uh, you know, we say, you know, names right, you know, things like that. So, uh, so I'll do that sort of at the end of the process, you know, um, you know, make sure that thing uh, doesn't get out, you know, uh, so, so that's sort of the day to day type of stuff is just make sure our producers have, um, the research that they need to, to do their shows. There must be just a ton of footage in the NFL films archives. Do you have an idea of, I don't know. Do you guys ever talk, keep track of how many hours worth the footage or tape reel or anything like that? Well, no, it, it's always changed a little bit. I mean, you know, each season there's going to be additional stuff. So, so, uh, you know, so, you know, that, that changes every year. Um, and we're also like somewhat in, in transition of things that are, everything's pretty much been sh- was shot on film into, until about, you know, six, seven years ago. And now we shoot pretty much everything just on, on digital cards. Uh, that's just the way the, the, you know, society or the, the business is now. You, you shoot on digital, you know, uh, every once in a while we might choose something still on film. Uh, but that 50 years of library, even previous stuff that's all still exists, you know, um, on film, you know, if we ever have to transfer it or, you know, not everything's on tape that we have shot over since 1965. So, um, so yeah, there's millions and millions of, old, of reels of, of footage. <laughs> Yeah, and the thing that comes to my mind is just going into one of those old school libraries where you see the books that are, you have to have a ladder that's five stories high just to get up to their wheels. And the organization must have been just crazy, either good or crazy hard. What was it when you first came in there before really the digital age? What was the organization like? Well, yeah, there's, 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 there's there was three libraries, so to speak, in, in our building. You know, one is the film library. So, Anytime something that was shot on film, the original film is stored, you know, in a can, uh, in, in that library. So, um, so there's, you know, there's from 1965 to, you know, you know, 2012 or whatever, all that film still exists, you know, in, in some sort of way in cans in our film library. Then we have our tape library, which at the point, you know, like in the mid eighties to the late, you know, to the late eighties, Everything was transferred or tried to tra- and then was put on to tape. So we have a tape library of everything and there's all the masters. Uh, now if something happens to the master, we always have the film we can go back and transfer. So, so we have a tape library that does that. And then the third library is my library, which is a, um, 
sort of a copy of the master library. And this is, those are the tapes that the producers would use and they could come in, they could grab it and they could check it out and then they could take it to their office. They digitize it and then they can cut that footage, but that's not the master tape. So, so those three libraries, you know, still exist, but now everything is digital. So that automatically just gets transferred onto our system now. Um, so, you know, going forward, that's a challenge of how that's going to get preserved because, you know, a digital file is different from physically having the tape or physically having the actual film. You know, you know, Hank Stram was shot on film, you know, his wire from Super Bowl four. Well, now all our wires are shot digitally. So what, what's that challenge is going to be, you know, 40 years from now, what those tape or what that digital file is going to exist as, you know, so, so that's always a challenge going forward, but that's sort of what we look at now of, of being able to preserve all our stuff in, in the libraries that we have in our building. Yeah. Uh, is it difficult to transfer over, say, the olden times you bring up Hank Stram's audio footage that was on film? Is it like a one for one process where you got to let it go the whole time or can it be sped up? Well, what do you mean? As you use it in a show or? So if you if you were to use that in a, a nowadays show for a documentary that you created in 2020, would you be able to transfer that? audio over somehow digitally or is what's the process for that yeah no it, it's already done you know like once it's done uh you know like we transferred the film to tape you know years ago you know so that it's already on tape um now we might retransfer it just so we can make it look better you know the quality might look better uh but once it goes on the digital file it can ex- exist like almost anything on a digital file forever so we don't ever have to transfer it again, you know, unless, you know, like going from standard def to high def to high def to 4K, like unless something like that changes it where we might have to transfer it again. But once you transfer it to digital file, it should exist on the digital file forever, you know. So so it's not like we transfer it every single time for every single time we want to, to use it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense because otherwise that would be a, a lot of transfer. And I, I would... Is it fair to say that not every single piece of in those old metal cans has been transferred over to digital or have you guys really backed up everything already? No, no, not everything has been transferred onto a digital file. So, I mean, like I said, we started shooting full games in night 65. So you're talking, you know, over 50 years of film. <laughs> right. So it, so it just depends what projects up. Some, some things are on the digital file more than others just because of a project like like this year with top 100 or or say we do a show uh, on uh, gail sayers well we'll transfer all his game footage so anything from the bears you know in the 60s and early 70s all that's probably on the digital file but if we go and do a show on jim brown we might not have transferred all the browns footage so it just depends what project as you go forward because you know you just don't have the physical time to do everything. I mean, it would take us, you know, years and years to, to physically, you know, do everything that <laughs> right. we want to do. So. Yeah, I mean, that's just crazy amount of footage, I, I would imagine. What about yeah. prior to NFL Films' existence, all the footage from the the older time days? Does that get warehoused at all with you guys, or is that somewhere else? Yeah, no, we, we, we have a lot of that. We we bought that in the 80s. Uh, Telraw was the, um, the company that did all the newsreels and the, and the footage uh, in the fifties and early sixties, uh, when they went out of business, uh, NFL films acquired, you know, uh, that library. So we have a lot of, we pretty much have almost every game, a lot from, from, from the late forties to now of all NFL stuff before, you know, the late forties, then it's hit or miss. That's why you don't see as much from the 20s, 30s and early forties is is because there was no tell Raw or NFL film shooting games on a weekly and shot every game. So. Right. And uh, speaking of NFL films, of course, we got to go to the Sables. Uh, did you work directly with Steve at all? I did. Um, his father, Ed, who started the company, had just retired when I started um, as an intern in 1995. Um, Steve was the president at that time. So, uh, so for 17 years, um, my office was almost right down the, down the hall from him. So, um, uh, he was tremendous to work for. He was a great boss. Um, easy to talk to. His door was always open. Um, that you could go in, you could talk 
about anything, uh, or he would stop by, you know, the library and see if I needed anything. He was always, you know, trying to help you be better at what you needed and what you could, what you wanted to do, you know, uh, uh, and that started even with his dad, but Steve would always say, what do you need? What, what can I do to make your job better? You know, uh, you know, so he was tremendous, uh, in that aspect, you know, I love working for him. Um, you know, it was, um, you know, like I said, he, he would do anything for you, whether you're a cameraman, whether you're a producer, whether you're a, you know, audio or mixer or in music, uh, and he didn't care if you were, had been there one year or for some of these producers had been there for 30, 30, 40 years, you know, he would, he would, uh, like I said, have his door open. He would get you everything you needed to, to make your job better and to do the best shows that you could possibly do. So, um, so, so yeah, it was tremendous to work for him. Yeah, it sounds like a great individual that one of the many reasons why NFL Films has been so successful and their mantra and the mentality. And I'm glad he's being recognized more this year, too, and just how all that's going down this year with the Centennial. Yeah, that was a tremendous honor, and I was glad to, that he finally got it because uh, I know he wanted it for his dad. He didn't think he was worth but yeah, so it's nice that uh, him and his dad now are, are both in there. Boom! Chris Willis, the head of the research library at NFL Films, a position that, well, <laughs> quite frankly, goes hand in hand with this podcast. So I'm thinking that, me personally, that's probably a pretty cool career. Not saying it's an easy career because there's a lot of work that goes into that, but I think it would be pretty neat to be able to dive into old historical artifacts and videos and all these other things to be able to conjure up the stories that NFL Films tells like nobody's business and with that i do hope that you enjoyed this week's episode of the football history dude podcast and i hope that you gained some gridiron knowledge nuggets about what chris was able to bring to the show and what goes on behind the scenes at nfl films if you did enjoy this show then i ask that you please share it with at least one more football geek such as yourself and the best way you can do that to give more information on the show and chris well, let's send them over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash Chris Willis. Now, this was just the first part of the interview. We're going to go ahead and finish the interview with Chris Willis next week. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. I put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand, and that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect. Ah, oh, that's a nice one. College football, 1923, Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. Wilson certainly was great On the next kickoff, who would end up as returner? But Harry Wilson. Wilson dodged at least a half dozen Recall the greatest moment in sports history, or just your own personal favorite, with Row One Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Telephone cases, coffee mugs.
blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. When the gun started to mark the end of the so. day, remain Penn State 14 to 0. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.